So let's start. And we happy to have Sasha Gancharov from Yale. He has changed his title and the title is on the screen, Cluster K2 Varieties and Applications. I changed the title, but not the topic. Uh, uh, so what I want, but uh, I want to give you some story. Uh, so uh, uh, the story has application. And so I start with this application. It's one of the applications. And uh, what uh, I'm aimed to is a combinatorial formula for the second Chern class. Uh, uh, so the second Chern class, it's second Chern class of a bundle. Now this E is a G bundle uh, on uh, some manifold M. And what is important is that G is any uh, split uh, group over Q. And I will use actually assumption that it's simply connected. Actually, I can take reductive group with uh, like GLN, but never mind. Uh, so I want to talk about second chain class. Uh, and this is just a very simple thing. It's just element of four-dimensional cohomology of this n manifold M with coefficients in two pi i uh, square z. And uh, mm, there is a kind of generator for this, a standard uh, chain class. And I want to get explicit construction of this. Now, what do I mean by explicit construction? So let me give you a warm-up example. Let's suppose that I start not with G bundle, but with a line bundle, same manifold. So it's a line bundle. And uh, I'm interested not in the second churn class, but in the first churn class, first churn class of this line bundle, uh, which lies in second dimensional cohomology of M with coefficients in two pi i z. Then, of course, everybody knows how to do this and what to do is, uh, but let me remind you what to do. So first of all, you pick some uh, cover of your manifold by let's say contractible sets, UI. And then uh, you make some uh, choices. Uh, you say that you pick up some section as I of your line bundle uh, uh, on, on, on this uh, open set. So it's a section of your line bundle. Let's assume it's not zero section. And then uh, what you actually can do, you can divide the sections when you live on intersections and get the functions out of this. So let's do this. Uh, I hope it's still visible. So uh, we can mm, mm, take uh, two open sets, uh, take the intersection, and then on this intersection, uh, we have a function fij, which is just the ratio of these two sections. And this function is a non-zero function by assumption. And so we can pick its logarithm. Of course, logarithm is a multivalid function, so we cannot uh, do it uniquely, but up to two pi ij, it's well-defined. So we do that, just write it better. And uh, then here's our cycle. So we take uh, three open sets, EGK, and we assign to this the following number. We take uh, the branch we picked on IJ plus the branch we picked on JK plus the branch we picked on uh, KI. And that's exactly what we're looking for. So this belongs, you can check that this belongs to two pi IZ. And that's uh, the cycle. So you wanted to do the same, uh, this is a very, very well-known construction, but you wanted to do the same with the second chain class and not even with a vector bundle, but every uh, G bundle you want to, to be able to treat. And uh, so that's the problem and some kind of history of this problem. It's, I think it's, it's interesting. So, uh, mm, uh, so, I mean, if we start this question, what is, uh, construction for C2 of vector bundle, then uh, the first uh, attempt approach uh, is going back to Gabrielov 
uh, uh, Gelfand and Losik. This is 1974, and they treat not this one, but they treat the first Pantagen class of, let's say, of fourfold. So it's a four dimensional bundle on a, a, a four dimensional manifold. Tangent bundle takes first Pantagen class. Uh, and uh, you can ask the question so, what, what was the point? Because, of course, any Chern class or any Pantagen class can be given by a formula, for example, using the curvature. But uh, Gelfand, Gabriel of Gelfand Losik were looking for combinatorial formula. So as I said, we want a combinatorial formula. And what does it mean? So you imagine that we have not a manifold, but for example, a polyhedron. And so you cannot uh, apply any kind of curvature and so on because it will not make sense. So uh, that's what combinatorial means for them. So it was some attempt to go, you know, to, to, to get more refined construction of the Pantagen class, but uh, in what sense more refined wasn't quite clear, and so this is the way um, they uh, approach this problem. Uh, similar, at, at the same time, uh, there were other people trying to do the same. So another attempt was due to Dennis Sullivan, which didn't come up with a complete solution. And another was a Chern, and that's how the chern simons invariant was born. So it's, they, they, they look at the same problem. It's chern simons is about 1973. Anyway, so now let me change a little bit uh, the gist. So I'm not talking about combinatorial formula for characteristic class on a polyhedron. I'm talking about something of algebraic shape. And so what I want to talk about, I want to talk about a uh, motivic uh, kind of formula. And so I actually trying to make sense, what does it mean to get the refined version of the Chern class? And my approach is that I want motivic uh, Chern classes. At the time, uh, like 1974, the concept not, was not there at all, but then in the 80s was balanced on his idea of motivic cohomology, and so by 90s it was already there. And so for in the case when G equals GLN, uh, the problem was solved. Uh, so I did this in 1993. There's a paper explicit uh, construction of characteristic classes. You can find it, for, for example, on my website. Uh, but uh, it, and actually it was sold for any uh, chain class uh, of a vector bundle, but it was especially explicit when n is not bigger than three, in particular n equals two, it was, it was very explicit formula. Now, uh, what I wanted to do today, I wanted to do basically the same thing, but I want to do it for any G bundle, and this is much, much uh, more complicated problem, and I will explain why. So. It certainly cannot be reduced to the case of GLN. Uh, so, okay. So the um, I so you see you seem to divide the page by two, then by four, then by eight. I uh, no no no. You you are well ahead of me. So I can only divide by two, and uh, no more than that. So if you can divide by eight, go ahead. But I cannot do this. Okay, <laughs> uh, all right, so this is my page divided so that you can see at least the record. All right, so uh, mm, uh, I have to start with some preliminary. So to cut it short, the uh, upshot is that I have to define what does it mean motivic chain class and end up with some kind of explicit construction of it. And Part of my lecture, the construction is impossible without uh, cluster variety. It's basically, I can ex I will try to explain what is cluster variety in in kind of attempt to do this. And on the other hand, this construction I was referred to in oh, 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 sorry, actually, do you still hear me? Hello. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Because I got a message, my internet is unstable, so it may happen that at that moment I will have to rejoin you. So beg your pardon. Okay, so uh, uh, even for the case of GLN, when I said the problem was solved, actually it was used less la later, like a decade later, by uh, Volody Fock and me to, to actually construct cluster structure. And so it's not a surprise that, that these two problems are intimately related. But I'm going to explain this. Okay, so the next thing is that uh, I want to explain uh, uh, whether the 
you know, this K2 varieties come from. So let's suppose that you have uh, V, any variety. And for simplicity, I'll assume that it's variety over Q. And uh, mm, uh, let's suppose that you have a form, which is a two form with logarithmic singularities on this variety. And this form is closed. Uh, and also, this is extremely important, the periods, uh, so if you try to integrate over two cycles, the periods uh, belong to this uh, subset of numbers, 2 pi i square z. Uh, so here's an example of such a form. We can say that this omega is given as a sum of epsilon ij uh, d log of a i, which d log of a j. And here, this AIs are just certain functions, regular functions on my uh, variety V. And uh, epsilon IJ is Q-symmetric tensor, and I assume that its values in Z, so sum of IJ. And uh, I do not assume that uh, I have the same number of functions as dimension of my manifold can have very, very uh, lots of functions, doesn't matter. And uh, in this case, so this is a form which has this property periods are here. And basically, this is the only way you can uh, possibly do this because there is a conjecture, which is kind of, uh, it's conjectures of the price of Hodge conjecture. So it's certainly unproved. Uh, so it's like version of Hodge conjecture. It says that any uh, uh, pair uh, as above uh, with these properties uh, can be written in this form. in this form. So that's kind of example of what's uh, of this kind of form. Now uh, we can do better than that because what we can do, uh, we can upgrade this uh, uh, to form to element uh, of more algebraic nature. We can write this element W, which is sum of epsilon ij. Uh, and then uh, we take this functions, but now we put them in this is two of the field of functions of this variety. And uh, I need to recall the definition of K2. So what is K2 of F according to Milner? If F is a field, then this is just a quotient of the multiplicative group, which multiplicative group by the subgroup called the Steinberg relations. And uh, all possible elements X, uh, which belong to F star minus one. And uh, then uh, you can say that original form which you have omega is just uh, d log, uh, which d log of that w. And actually this d log d log map, uh, it's a map uh, which goes from k2, which I just defined of the field of functions uh, to uh, forms uh, with logarithmic singularities on v uh, closed and with this period condition as we just discussed. Now, another question which uh, was discussing right away, what are the singularities of this form? So we got some kind of class of form, but what are the singularities of those forms? That's also uh, in our hands. Uh, and we can do this as follows. Mm, I, again, need to remind you something, uh, this is a construction it's called tame symbol due to Tate. And so uh, this is a map from K2 of the field of functions uh, to direct sum over all possible uh, divisors, reducible divisors uh, of field of functions on this divisor. And it's defined by the uh, very well known formula F with G goes to a certain sign of f divisor of g multiplied by x divided by g of x. This would be nice, but that's not what happens. Uh, so uh, we have to, this makes no sense. We have raised this to the power of valuation d of g on, on the divisor of g and this to the power of valuation on d of f. 
then these two functions have, uh, the ratio has no pole on the divisor, so we can just restrict to the generic part of the divisor, and that's what it is. So that's the uh, invertible function on the divisor which we get. And uh, now we can uh, mm, define the group K2 of our variety V as just the kernel of the same symbol map. It's a kernel from the map from K2 on Q of V, field of functions, to direct sum over all divisors of this. Uh, but I think I work over Q, I can work over any field, it doesn't matter. So that's official definition of uh, the group K2 of a variety. And uh, now uh, the claim is uh, that uh, this omega, uh, I can actually call it omega sub w here. Omega sub w is uh, non-singular on a given divisor D, if and only if the residue in this algebraic sense, same symbol of this w is zero. And so you can see from this that we have canonical map from uh, K2 of V uh, to forms on this variety V. Okay, so this is what, uh, this is the uh, definition of two forms which have algebraic geometric origin. Actually, uh, it, they come from K2. That's what we wanted to say. And, uh, Uh, now I can say as a kind of a definition that uh, a K2 variety is just given by a pair, so it's a variety and then certain class in K2 of this variety, which I just defined what is K2. And we say that uh, you have symplectic K2 variety if uh, this form omega w is symplectic. Okay, so it looks very simple that you, you, you just take any variety, take a bunch of functions, take this uh, sum of epsilon ij, which you were talking about, which is just uh, still here, and you produce a class. But this is uh, very misleading because, for example, let's try to see how we can produce a class on a curve. So let's take an example. Let's suppose that uh, this V is a curve, projective curve over Q. Then it's actually very difficult to produce uh, such a class uh, uh, because there is a conjecture. So this is Bellinson's conjecture, which says that actually this K2 class is finite dimensional model. I mean, it's uh, just, a fine rank uh, abelian group and actually its rank is known in the dimension of some uh, topological invariant of your curve r of two plus i assume uh, the curve is a uh, real number so rational number so the complex conjugation x here and so this is two but the main point is that this is topological cohomology of a curve. So it's, you know, genus G curves. It has, we know how big is H1. And that's it. So for example, if you take V to be elliptic curve, then according to Benson, there is just one dimensional K2. But- uh, uh, Sash, yes. can you kind of be a little bit more, like K2 of V of course is not, isomorphic to dimension of something, yeah? Uh, no, I mean, I mean rank. Yes. And uh, this uh, variety is and over- with coefficients and what H1? Uh, so this is, okay, so this is, you take first of all complex coins of your curve. For example, it's elliptic curves. Yeah. Then you take coefficients, uh, in this case it's just R, because R of two is the same as R. Oh, okay. It's 2 pi i squared r, it's r. Yeah, yeah. Now you have a plus complex conjugation acting simultaneously here and here, but here this means basically nothing here. Oh, it, but here it means that you have a class which is invariant under the complex conjugation. And so out of two cycles, you get just one, okay? And so Bellison would tell you that in this case, uh, the K group has dimension one, rank one. This is not known in any single case, I would say. There is no any curve in the world where we know that's true. And uh, at least he would say that there exists at least one element here. 
And in order to prove this, you have to use modularity. You have to use, you know, maser Weil's uh, theorem to prove this, plus some results of Bellinson. What I'm saying is that if you try to construct, if somebody gives you elliptic curve or Q, you try to construct class in K2, good luck. I mean, you can do this for any given curve, but you cannot prove this without big technology that you can do this for any curve. And there is no construction, so it's kind of, uh, very sporadic object, and it's so sporadic because it relates uh, to the value of L function of this curve uh, at two. I'm saying all the two must the two varieties, but it's a non trivial object. And so, even for the curve, it's a non trivial object. Okay, so now my point is that I want to go to high dimensional varieties, and my point is that there exists a big supply, uh, you know, some class of situations. Well, actually, you can't construct uh, a K2 variety. And that's precisely this cluster varieties. So you can say that cluster varieties is a tool to do this. So let's see how this works. I don't assume uh, you know what is cluster variety. I'm about to introduce them. So we're talking about cluster varieties. Oh. Uh, so this A varieties. And um, so uh, uh, what we do, we do the same thing as before. We say that, okay, so let's start with a variety V and let's write it to form exactly the way we did it before. Epsilon IJ D log AI which D log AJ. And then uh, we insist in this case uh, that the number of functions is the same as, uh, so it's ij goes from one to n, dimension of v is precisely this n, that the number of coordinates match the dimension of the manifold, of variety. So, uh, but even if this is not true, so for now you may assume it's not actually true, uh, you can still define the notion of mutation. So what is a mutation on this? language, so we pick any uh, k between one and n, so we just pick one coordinate, and then uh, we say, all right, let's write down the following equations that we introduce a new function, a k prime, such that a k prime times a k equals the sum of two monomials, m plus plus m minus, which, is, which are defined as follows. So one of them is a product of this a j epsilon kj, this is the epsilon we were talking about, this one's, but the product has to be taken uh, according to those j where epsilon kj is bigger than zero. And therefore this monomial is a regular monomial. And then we wanted to do the same with the product of aj where epsilon kj is less than zero. But, uh, and we want to write here epsilon kj. That's not going to fly because that's going to be not a regular function. And so we put the minus sign. So that's it, so this is our monomial. So this monomial is called uh, M plus, and this monomial, for obvious reasons, is called M minus. Now, after introduce, uh, I introduce this formula, so look, so I just have coordinates, and I just introduce a new function by this formula. So just M plus plus M minus divided by AK. And uh, there is a claim that you can reconcile uh, your omega in this new coordinate system. So what is a new coordinate system, first of all? So uh, I introduce AK prime, but I want to have the other coordinates, AJ prime, to be AJ if uh, J is not equal to K. So I just changed one coordinate by this rule. So this is a cluster mutation rule uh, invented by Fermin and Zelewinski. So this is... Uh, I mean, the Levinsky uh, mutation. But uh, the next thing is uh, less standard. So uh, uh, there is a claim that exactly the same form omega can be written now in exactly the same shape uh, ij epsilon ij, but epsilon ij are different now. Uh, using now new functions, the log ai prime, which the log of aj prime. So we can just rewrite omega 
uh, in new coordinates and we pick up a new uh, tensor epsilon ij, which is also is going to be integral. But the really crucial fact is not this. Uh, the really crucial fact that if we uh, make this uh, as usual w, which is sum of uh, original epsilon ij ai wedge aj, I no longer put them in parentheses, so they belong to the wedge square of the field of functions on my variety. So uh, I can now make W prime is given exactly the same formula with primes. And the statement is that if you subtract from one the other, you don't get zero, but you get expression one plus certain function multiplied by the same function. And this XK is just the ratio of this m plus divided by m minus, which was introduced just minutes before. So this is a crucial part. And what it says, it says that although uh, not only the form uh, doesn't change, but the class of this form in K2 also doesn't change. So this implies that the class of the form W is the same as the class of the form W prime in K2 of your variety. And so this means that now uh, we get uh, a class in K2, which we can write in many, many ways, because as usual in this cluster business, we can take one coordinate system, you know, A1 and so on, AN, and then we can mutate it in all N directions, and then again mutate, and again mutate, and so on. So we have many, many different presentations of this class uh, as element of lambda 2, and they're all different. And not only that they're all different, uh, you know, this, you get this integers, they're all different, but they represent the same class. Okay, so I can just say that this uh, kind of trick is just a device how to produce a class in K2, which cannot be written in a kind of uh, unique way, in a canonical way. It can be written only in many, many different ways. There's no canonical presentation, uh, but mm, Still, this is a way to produce some kind of class. All right, so, oops, sorry. Uh, oh, it's not exactly, just a second. Okay. All right, so, uh, if you decipher this uh, construction and try to see what this coefficient epsilon ij, you will recover the formulas uh, for the quiver mutations, which are very well known in this business. Namely, you can prove that this epsilon ij prime is given by this very well known formula. It's either minus epsilon ij, or it's epsilon ij, or it's epsilon ij plus uh, absolute value of epsilon ik times epsilon kj and uh, any anybody who have seen cluster story have seen this formula this formula is for the mutation of the quiver and this formula was discovered by Zyberg uh, in 95 and Famin and Zelevinsky in their work on cluster algebras in 201 and what I'm saying I'm saying that this formula is automatic if you just uh, write down uh, the same form omega in new coordinate systems. So if, if you try to, 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 if not omega, w, if you try to write w in a new coordinate system in such a way that you explicitly take care of this time of relation, you are forced to have this form. So it's, uh, and vice versa. So the very fact that you get uh, this kind of uh, difference is equivalent to this form. Okay, so, now you can say that this is how you can think about cluster varieties because what happened is this, that uh, let's suppose we take some coordinate chart, it's C star to N, uh, where you originally had uh, coordinates AI, and you have a different chart, C star to N, where you had now new coordinates and I prime. And uh, you introduce here, uh, uh, sub variety gamma, which is just a graph of mutation map. So that's exactly the formulas uh, which we had before. So I'm referring to uh, I 
I'm referring to this. So this mutation formula, it defines you a way how to produce uh, new coordinates from the old ones. So it gives you some, course, some, some kind of uh, sub variety here. And the claim is that this variety, not only it's uh, isotropic, and actually just for freedom of terminology, I will assume the determinant is not zero. And so in this case, I can say that this is Lagrangian variety. That's the main property. But it's more than Lagrangian, it's K2 Lagrangian uh, sub variety. So this means uh, that if you take uh, the class in K2, which you see here and here, and pull them back and take the difference restrict here, you get zero. That's a K2 Lagrangian sub variety. And my main point is that this is basically the only way how you can get Lagrangian sub variety because this is nonlinear. Uh, Lagrangian sub variety. And also uh, you can have, uh, uh, linear ones in a very cheap way, uh, you can just take, uh, so I would say that linear uh, K2 Lagrangians are the same thing as uh, monomial transformations of the C star to N, which preserves the form. Uh, uh, the form omega or W. And now I'm saying that if you take this uh, monomial uh, plus uh, this kind of mutations. Uh, uh, monomials. Transformations and cluster mutations. Then the supply of uh, sub varieties you can get by composition of these constructions uh, is conjecturally uh, the only way you can get uh, K2 Lagrangian sub varieties. So this is basically the way to get K2 Lagrangian sub varieties. And so the first nonlinear example of K2 Lagrangian sub variety, it was, we understood this on, only with uh, Valodia Fock in 2003, that this, Lagrange, this, this mutation business provides you a first kind of nonlinear, non-trivial example of K2 Lagrangian sub variety. And we think there is no other way to produce them. So this is sort of why uh, one of the applications of this cluster story. Okay, so what did we get so far? So the takeaway from this discussion is this. Uh, I can still do it here. Uh, so cluster uh, variety structure on certain geometric variety V uh, is just a way, is a way to produce a class in K2, which as I demonstrated, it's usually it's quite non-trivial problem where to get this class. Uh, and uh, produce this class without writing canonical represent, without or maybe with infinitely many representatives. Without or with infinitely many uh, representatives. So now we are going to use this idea. We learned that the way to produce K2 class is this. Mm, one more thing which I wanted to tell you before I go to applications is, is this. I wanted to see when I get actual class on the whole variety, not only on some generic part, because this and that give you only class as a generic part. Uh, you don't see it. Uh, in general, uh, and so the uh, there is a lemma which says the following. So remember that we uh, did cluster mutation, and we get this new function a k prime. A priori, this is a rational function, Laurent polynomial. But let's suppose that this function is actually regular may happen. Then uh, I claim that uh, the residue uh, of uh, this class W on the divisor AK equal to zero is actually zero. And uh, so I'll prove this in a second, but this uh, give us the following uh, main definition. We say that uh, some coordinate uh, is frozen if this residue is not zero.
because when you have some natural cluster variety, and I'll give you uh, just a little example. Uh, so let's suppose you're talking about the simplest example to talk about. One of the simplest is this. You take a configuration of four vectors uh, in two-dimensional vector space, uh, which has uh, some symplectic form. And then uh, if you consider space of configuration of four vectors, uh, modulus the action of SL2, if it's five-dimensional space and the coordinates you can get as follows, you can just take the values of this form on this Li, Lj, uh, which correspond precisely to the uh, edges and one of the diagonals. We have five of them. These are the cluster coordinates. But if you try to take a residue of this, uh, write down the corresponding form uh, omega, I'm not going to tell you exactly this epsilon ij, it's very well known, but if you try to take residue, well, let's say omega of E1 and E2 equal to zero of this omega, you'll discover this is not equal to zero. And from this, you learn that you cannot mutate this variable because if you can, by this lemma, it must be zero, but you do a little calculation and see it's not. So this shows that this uh, form, W form, it not only tells you cluster structure, but it tells you which variables are frozen in the cluster structure, which are not, which is usually uh, in the usual definition of cluster algebra, you can take any number of variables as frozen and you can do whatever you like, but if it's realized on a manifold, then you don't have this freedom at all. That's the point of this lemma. Okay, so why is this lemma correct? Uh, this is a one line uh, calculation because uh, you just take the residue uh, on this divisor of this class and you discover that this is precisely this m plus by m minus, this function restricted to the sub variety when a k equal to zero. But uh, if you have this equation, uh, uh, you know, a k prime times a k equals m plus plus m minus, this implies that if uh, this coordinate is zero, this implies that m plus over n minus is just minus one because the sum is zero. And therefore, uh, if you calculate this residue um, and you use this formula, you immediately see that this expression is just minus one. So it vanishes in multiplicative group. It's just element of torsion two, so that's it. The simple observation tells you that uh, there are frozen variables. You cannot do anything about this, so they are frozen. But also, uh, raise this and all other variables which are uh, not equal to zero. And so we're going to use this in a cool way. All right. Okay, now I can state the main result. Uh, and I will need to explain it. That, uh, so it's the main theorem. That for any uh, G as above, as above means it's a split semi-simple algebraic group uh, with a fundamental group trivial. Uh, uh, there is, uh, non-unique, but still there is a cycle uh, representative uh, for the, what I call, for the second motivic chern class. And now I have to define, what do I mean by second motivic chern class? So, uh, I take, uh, so this second chern class, Motivic, belongs to the cohomology group H4 of uh, BG. This is a classifying space for the group G. Uh, these coefficients in second, in the way to Motivic complex, which I'm about to define. So the claim is that there is such a class and I can construct this class. And also the claim is that the group on the right is just Z. So there exists here a generator, and that's exactly uh, the guy which corresponds to my C2. So C2 precisely corresponds to the generator 
under this isomorphism. So that's my goal. I want to construct this class, but I need to explain uh, what are the motivic complexes first. So, uh, so the story goes as follows. So Bellinson in uh, 81 uh, said the following. He made the following conjecture that if S is anything, any scheme, uh, then uh, he said that uh, one should have uh, motivic cohomology of this scheme uh, with, which have weight n. So this means that this gadget is indexed by two indices, by the uh, number of the cohomology and by this number of n, which is the weight of the cohomology. Usually cohomology is numbered by one index, but here's two. That's number one. He actually even said what, what they're supposed to be. I don't really care, some piece of K group. But he also said that one should have some complex of, uh, actually just complex of abelian groups related to this variety uh, and the weight. And then the cohomology group of this complex should give this motivic cohomology group. So he conjectured uh, the, the existence of this uh, motivic complexes. And there is a long story about this, which I don't want to tell you, but uh, the weights are non-negative. And it's also very easy to see uh, who are those motivic complexes if uh, the number n is small, for example, zero or one. Then these motivic complexes are very clear. And uh, here we are. So if n equals to zero, then balance on material complex is just a group Z. So uh, this gamma uh, motivic uh, of the weight zero for whatever scheme is just Z. If n equals one, it's also very easy. Uh, this complex related to any scheme of weight one is just this. So you have to take, let's suppose your scheme is overfilled. You have to take field of rational functions and map it by our residue map to direct some of these related to all divisors. Then if you put uh, in this complex, uh, this group in degree one and this group in degree two, this is balances motivic complex. And here the group is in degree zero. So, for example, uh, by his definition, uh, you have that this H2 motivic of X is coefficients in Z of 1, is just the Picard group of X. And so this motivic cohomology is a generalization of Picard groups. All right, but I'm, uh, I really care not about uh, the first motivic complex, but about the second motivic complex. And uh, I need to tell you how it looks like. That's the next story. And so if you take the second motivic complex, so it's gamma motivic of X of weight two, then you can define this as follows. So there is some group which I'll define in a second, which calls the block group of your uh, field of functions. Then this group maps to the second wedge square of the multiplicative group of your field. Then by the residue map, or we call it M symbol, it maps to the direct sum over all divisors of K over the divisor. And then it maps to uh, direct sum, uh, should make it a little smaller. Anyway, so direct sum of all co-dimensional two divisors uh, over Z. So this is a complex and the point is that this group is in degree one, this group is in degree two, this group in degree three, and therefore this is in degree four. Sash, what is the divisor of co-dimension two? I mean, uh, could, sorry, irreducible <laughs> sub variety of co-dimension two. Okay. Sorry. Excuse me, your degrees are homological or cohomological? Cohomological. So there is a differential here. Okay, yeah. got it, thanks. Mm -hmm. And so this is a residue map. That's another differential. And so this is a evaluation map. 
if you have function on a divisor, uh, you have evaluation map. Okay, so this is a motivic complex. And if you look at this definition, actually, I really sorry, this, so let me do it again because it's the most important thing right now and it doesn't fit to the screen. So let me fit it to the screen. So we have B2 of the field of functions. Then it maps to the wedge square of the multiplicative group of the field of functions. Then it goes by a residue map to direct sum of all divisors of uh, Q over this divisor star. And then uh, it goes to uh, direct sum over all uh, D, which is of codimension two uh, of the abelian group Z. And so this map is just evaluation. If you have a function standing here on a divisor, you can take evaluation and get, you know, number on the codimension two cycle. And as I said, this is one, two, three, four. Now, if you look at this definition, then the first thing you notice, uh, I didn't tell you what this guy is yet. And, uh, but uh, it turns out that if you just take H2 uh, of this complex, gamma motivic of X2, then uh, by our definition, which you had minutes ago, this is just the same as K2 of X. Why is this so? Because what do you need to do? You need to sit here. You need to take the residue of the, uh, you need to take the kernel of the residue map. And also you need modal by Steinbeck relations, which turns out by definition to be the image of this group. Now I can tell you what this group is. So let's, for simplicity, assume that you have F, which is a field. Then we can uh, cook up the following complex. We can take a free abelian group generated by F and map it to wedge two of F star by the rule that a generator X goes to one minus X wedge X. And then by definition, the co-kernel of this map delta gives you K2 uh, from this side. That's the definition because that's exactly the set of all Steinbeck relations. But now there is a certain subgroup here of some explicit linear combination of Steinbeck relations which dies into this map. So this is called the subgroup of the five term relations. Let me skip the definition. The uh, free abelian group is over all elements of the field or except zero and one. Uh, this is a good point. So uh, zero and one are not included. I should have said this. So this is first of all F star and also minus zero. Uh, so they're not included. So you're right. Uh, but I wanted to skip the definition of this group. This is the group which reflects the functional equations for the dialog written. And then uh, we define the block group as just the quotient of this free abelian group by this explicitly given subgroup of five term relations. Uh, And so now my, now my definition is complete. So now I have the complex and uh, I wanted to look at this complex more attentively. So first of all, let me make it a little smaller so we can look somewhere. Okay. Okay, we still see the complex. Uh, so uh, there is one uh, theorem about this uh, complex, which says that if you take uh, the cohomology group we care about, uh, but actually, mm, yeah, there's this four dimensional cohomology group of BG with coefficients in this complex denoted this way. 
So this is a complicated thing because you need to write down BG as a simplicity using Milner construction. And then you need to put for each component of this Milner construction, this complex of sheaves. So you get a bi-complex and you have to take the total complex of that. But no matter what, uh, the theorem is that this goes to be isomorphic to a third dimensional uh, cohomology group of G. But also motivic cohomology of G. And also uh, this group is Z. That's where the isomorphism I mentioned uh, here comes from. Uh, now, uh, what does it mean? So how do you think about this group? So what's the kind of downturn definition of this group? Mm, you can just see from the definition that uh, so dimensional homology of weight two of this group is by definition kernel of a certain map. So you take direct sum of all divisors of field of functions, these divisors, and you go by this time symbol map to direct sum of all these on codimension two subvarieties. So all in all, this means that uh, you need just to construct a collection of pairs uh, given by something like that. So if you have a linear combination of uh, divisors and certain functions of them, with the conditions that sum of the rays is zero, then that's exactly how you think about element in this group. And uh, the fact that this group is Z, uh, it's actually a theorem, which is due to uh, uh, Berlinski and Deline. Uh, it's 96. And actually, Deline, it was it proved several times by several kind of level of precision. So original goes to Deline like 78 or so. But uh, anyway, so it is known that we can uh, produce uh, that this group is Z and we can produce some cycle here. So it's, but it's known kind of, not, it's known that there exists such a cycle, but uh, I'm going to produce a very specific cycle. So I claim that uh, there is a specific cycle for the generator uh, of this group. And as you will see this, you can consider this as a kind of starting point of cluster story. So how the cycle looks like uh, for any group G, so remind you that we have simple reflections as one so on as uh, SR, uh, which generate the group W. And uh, we can consider a divisor, Schubert divisor, divisor on the flag variety DSI, which consists of all uh, Borel subgroup B prime, uh, which has the property that uh, mm, the kind of the distance between a given Borel subgroup B, so this is some given, the one I picked, and this variable B prime is actually this SI. By distance, I mean the standard fact that if you have two Borel subgroups, they belong to settle Schubert cell, which parameterized by element of the veil group. And so that's precisely what this notation tells you. So that's a divisor. And then uh, I claim, don't want to construct this, that there exists some canonical function of this divisor. F S I which is a function on this divisor TSI. And the claim is that this linear combination is a generator. So it generates H3 of G, uh, motivic. I didn't get these questions, but uh, somebody probably should have asked. So uh, how we understand this? So we're talking about motivic H3, uh, and I gave you the definition. But uh, how far this from the usual uh, uh, topological uh, subdimensional cohomology group? So they, of course, isomorphic. But the point is that this that there are somehow three uh, ways to think about H three or complex uh, semi-simple group. 
One of them is take the Durham viewpoint and take G inverse DG cube with some normalization if you want. Another is to take a, a topological cycle. That's so to speak Durham, Betty. But there's a third one, which is Motivic, which is the one I told you. And it's very different than the other two. And as usual, it's not guaranteed that, uh, that you can find such a presentation. So it's, it's always, it, it, it's that the, all these claims are of the price of Hodge conjecture. In this case, it's not that difficult to produce the cycle, but in general, nobody tells you that it should exist. It's like telling you that if you have class, uh, you know, Hodge class that comes from algebraic cycle, not necessarily. And just like this here, so if you have some kind of class here, so why it comes from algebraic cycles, not necessarily true, but in this case, we produce this class. All right, and one more thing, I want to give you an example. So if you consider SL2, then it acts on a two-dimensional sp space. And so you pick some line L in this two-dimensional space. And then you consider divisor D, which is given by the collection of matrices, which has the property that they preserve this line. And then you have a function because if you apply this G from this subgroup to any vector on this line, you get some multiple uh, F sub F sub G multiplied by L. And so this is a pair, so this D and F is precisely the pair which uh, corresponds to uh, this case in the case of SL2. All right, now, uh, uh, now let me go to the, uh, this main statement and explain uh, what do you need to do in order to prove this. Let me first of all remind you what is BG and EG. So EG looks as follows, so you put G, then uh, you put here G square, then you put here G cube, then you put here uh, G to four, and you keep going. Now, if you take this EG and you divide by the left diagonal action of G, you get the classifying space BG, that's Milner's construction. And so what we're really looking for, we're looking for cycle uh, in the fourth dimensional motivic cohomology, uh, meaning cohomology of this complex, motivic complex of EG uh, of weight two, but G invariant. So that's where the object we are interested in sits. As this motivic chain class. And uh, how it's supposed to be given to us? So it's supposed to have several components because there is one component which would sit here and we already constructed it. Then there will be another which sits here and another which sits here. And so all together it will be some kind of uh, cycle sitting in a bicomplex, which I don't want to write down. But the one which sits here we already presented. That's exactly. Uh, this construction I was telling you here. So this, this guy is the one which we are going to put here. This, it lives on the, uh, I mean, it lives on G, but it's actually, if you think about this G equivalent, it lives on G square, but just invariant on this left diagonal action of G. So it sits, it sits precisely here. Now, what we need to do in order to produce, so let's have some name for this. Let's call this uh, component W2. What do we need to do to produce some component W3? Well, uh, we need to solve some equation because, um, remind you once again, that this W2 is given as a sum of DSI, FSI. Now, the W3, the next component of the cycle is going to be uh, sitting in the following group. So I need to take the field of functions on G cube. I need to take a multiplicative group of this field and I need to take the second exterior product. And it needs to be in the G invariant part. And what is the main constraints? And the main constraint is that the residue of this class uh, W3 it is going to be precisely the pullbacks 
uh, of the uh, classes, uh, which uh, of the W2 classes. So here, this is the main equation to solve. So here we have G cube. It's going to go in three different ways to G square. This is my maps as I. And whenever I have anything sitting here, I can pull it back and get, you know, the sum divisor and function here. But then I need to find element in wedge two, uh, precisely here, which, uh, whose raise do give you this class. And so the answer is that that's precisely the cluster structure. So the key point that uh, construction of this, this component W3 uh, requires, it doesn't reduce it, but requires uh, uh, introducing cluster structure uh, uh, on some uh, relative, uh, related space. So I take uh, a cube where A is the principal affine space, divide this by the action of the group G, I call this a space of configurations of three flags. Uh, and so the claim is that I need to introduce a cluster structure on this space. Uh, and then if I do introduce this cluster structure, then this cluster structure in particular will give me this element W, which is written in my, uh, as I explained before, in this shape, but it lives in lambda two. And so all I would need to do I, will, I would need just to take the, investigate what is the residues of this class. And so you can think about this in a picture way as follows. So you have this uh, configuration space of three uh, finite decorated flags, a one and two and three, and uh, we construct some kind of class W uh, which sits on this configuration space. But then when we take the residue of this class, uh, uh, it is true, so it's proved that it sits only on the uh, pullbacks of some data which comes from the sides, from the pairs of flags. And so what you see on the sides, so that's the requirement, that's the main equation, that's precisely the class which we constructed, which represents a cohomology of G. So again, the bottom line, I'm out of time now, so the bottom line is that first of all, you can do this. Secondly, as soon as I have this class, uh, this one, uh, I'm kind of uh, bound to find cluster structure because I need to find some kind of element here uh, or here. In, 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 you know, in, when, uh, and this element is element of K2, but as I explained in the first half of the lecture, there is no way to construct element in K2 uh, known except if you have a cluster structure. And so in this case, indeed, uh, the only way to construct this element in, in lambda two and therefore in K2 is to introduce cluster structure and then you have infinitely many representatives of this element in K2 given by all clusters. But that's not the end of the story because uh, then you still need to do something uh, here. Uh, you can still take this class which you see. So here you see W3, but you can still pull it back to G4. And then you need to prove uh, that you still get a cycle. So you need to produce lots of Steinberg relations. And that turns out to be very similar to the following game. So let's suppose you have a triangulation like this. And here you have a one, a two, a three, and a four. And then you change triangulation to this one. So you do a flip. And so, uh, it is known in this business that flip is a cluster transformation. And when you decipher what this word means that it's a cluster transformation, it turns out that this gives you exactly, in this case, uh, the component. So this guy is a cluster transformation. And in this case, this is equivalent uh, to construction of this element W, uh, uh, you know, which lives on G4. And then there are some property of this construction which I don't want to discuss. So all in all, uh, what I just explained that if you, that in order to construct this class, you are bound to, to, to not only to find cluster structure and configuration of three flags, but you're bound to prove some its properties, which would imply that you have a construction. So this would imply, if you do all this, that you found a cluster structure on uh, the moduli space 
of G local systems related to uh, any decorated surface S. So I don't want to define the space, but basically you have the decorated surface, so you cut it into triangles, and then you put uh, the W classes on each of the triangle here. And then all you need to do, you need to prove that it's invariant under the flip, and that's precisely the other component of this cycle. So that's it. So I basically explained that uh, uh, you need to have cluster structure to, uh, of this space or on configuration space, which is very closely related. But you need to have more because the crucial ingredient uh, of the story was that this cycle has actually one more component sitting here. And this component is a kind of boundary conditions uh, on this cluster structure. So we actually never dealt uh, in cluster story before with this kind of constraints, but there is some kind of constraint which describes the third dimensional cohomology of the group G. And so when you put it all together, uh, so you get a construction of this, explicit construction of this class. Once again, you need cluster structure to write it down, but then using these explicit constructions, you can produce combinatorial construction of the chain class I was talking about before with coefficients in Z. And uh, this is, you know, that, that's, that's the explicit combinatorial formula for the second chunk class. So what I'm saying is that there is no uh, easier way to do this than this, and you're bound to discover class to structure if you want to do this. Or if you do it in a different way, you kind of, uh, you're already doing class to structure. So that's it. So that was my message that uh, these two stories are closely related. Uh, and this cycle has many applications, but I'm not going to talk about this. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Sasha. Great talk. Uh, questions, please. Yeah, uh, I have a question about uh, the definition of the group B2 of uh, F above. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, well, uh, I saw uh, several definitions of this group uh, by using uh, curly R, Straight, uh, what, uh, what kind of a capital you mean in the quotients? Uh, first of all, I'm not that uh, fluent in these different definitions. I know only one. And uh, well, this is a definition which I use. Uh, yeah, so my computer a little slow. So this is the definition which I use. And I call it block group. And if you read other papers, uh, this is not what they call block group, that's all I can tell you. They call by block group the kernel of the map uh, from, um, they ba basically take the kernel of this map and call it this Carly B or something like that, okay? No, I, I, I mean that uh, by R capital two, uh, I refer to your papers. So, and in your papers, uh, for example, in advances mass uh, paper, if I clearly remember, you have uh, several uh, several types of R2. One is given by means of, uh, for example, functions fields on curves. Another type is given I see, by... I see, I see, I, 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 I understand. It's, it's, a, it's a technical question, but the answer is that I'm using the most precise definition of the group B2 possible. The ones you refer to, these are definitions uh, which one need to go if you define higher block groups, but they are not necessary here. And so this, uh, these definitions are needed to uh, avoid explicit description of the subgroup of the functional equations because we don't know them explicitly, okay? Yeah, but okay, but what do you mean then by R2 here in this particular B2? Okay, definition. So uh, we take projective line uh, over field F we take five points on projective line, which are distinct. We call them X1 and so on, X5. Yeah, okay. uh, we take, you ask the question, so let me yeah, okay. the answer. We forget one of them, we get the cross ratio. We put this in parentheses and take alternating sum of these expressions. And this is by definition belongs to this group R2 and the group R2 is by definition generated by those expressions, okay? Okay, thanks. And so they are parameterized by five types of distinct points on projective line, and they're explicitly given as sum of five generators of three abelian group generated by F. And their main property is that they killed 
that if you consider the corresponding Steinberg relations, their sum is zero in lambda two of F star. Okay, uh, uh, sorry, uh, may I ask another question, please? Uh, I'm asking the chair. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I mean, okay. it's, it's a free country. You can unmute yourself, yeah. ask uh, what you are interested in. Is, is, it, is it a free country? Uh, Sasha, it's a subject of a different talk. Let's concentrate on yours. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, at uh, least uh, here in Kansas. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, you can see the classes in H uh, upper four uh, BG uh, Z your uh, Z two. If you replace, uh, for example, your Z two by uh, Vyvodsky Z two. Mm, Vyvodsky is a is a great general definition, but uh, in this story, it's not useful. Uh, it's not useful. So uh, your uh, classes in H4 with uh, coefficients in your complexes are not related. Uh, no, no, no. You, you, can, you can produce class in this complex, and then you can, uh, I bet it's possible, you can produce cycle in, in a complex which Vyvodsky use or Bloch use, like high. Well, yeah, for example, yes. It is known that, that, that you can map one complex to the other. But if you started, if you wanted to do what I'm doing, as I just explained, uh, uh, if you work with this, with this variant of the motivic complex, you're bound to, to discover cluster structure. You're absolutely bound. So if somebody gives you this you know, element which uh, gives you cycle, cohomology group of G, and you pull it back in three different terms, and then try to write down this as a residue of something, you, you, for any group except GLN, for GLN there is a canonical representative, and this is what makes the story infinitely simpler for GLN. But for any Gaza group, there is no canonical representative. And in order to find any, you must introduce cluster structure, because as soon as you write down any representative, you are talking about cluster structure. It's just the same thing, basically. I mean, almost same thing. You can maybe write it in a very kind of bad way where you don't quite see that they're coordinates. So here what happens is a kind of, again, a great coincidence that when you write down this uh, element in H2 of the field of functions, it turns out that it has uh, in its definition exactly the same number of functions, which is dimension of your space, a configuration, which dimension of the space of configurations of free degraded flags. That's a uh, absolutely remarkable fact. Nobody expects this and that's why they're coordinates cluster coordinates, but if there wouldn't be coordinates, we'd have like more of them or less than them, still we can write around a similar story. It's, it's okay. So again, so if you want to write, if you want to write explicit presentation, you, you're bound to find cluster structure. That's why this problem actually, for other groups, this problem was unsolved and uh, wasn't clear what to do with this because the problem was known for a long time but it wasn't clear how to deal with this now it's clear why because you need to introduce cluster structure and you don't have canonical representatives and so you need to have the whole package okay thanks uh more questions just i have sort of a stupid question but kind of maybe it doesn't make sense. So you're talking about cluster structures and so your mutations correspond to mutations of quivers. And this appears in relation to some motivic cohomology, I would say, constructing representative of some class in motivic. Exactly. Now, if, exactly. Yeah, if, if I, all right. Now, for the quivers, I can add the potential, which means that I go from surfaces to something three-dimensional. Uh, do I see some exponential motivic on the other side? Upgrade? Uh, I actually don't, don't know whether this... So I don't know, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to this question. I know how to upgrade them. For example, in a canonical way, absolutely canonical way for GLN, you get canonical potential, not just some potential. Again, everything. Yeah, yeah this, 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 this I know, but uh, how but, is it related to, to the motivic story? Not quite. And also, I should tell you that this is only part of the, uh, you know, of the truth. The whole truth is that the cluster story is much more precise than the motivic story. 
So it turns out that it's convenient that if somebody doesn't like clusters and doesn't like writing formulas, this is a way I explain to such a person that you are bound to, to use it because otherwise you cannot construct anything. But when you construct it, you discover that the cluster structure gives you more than what you call mod. Maybe I'll tell you next time what exactly I mean by this. Okay, great. Well, I, ca I catch you, so there will be next time. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, okay, great. Um, more questions? Uh, so your network construction is for the group. So the, uh, uh, the can, can you speak the... louder, Zonji? Sorry, oh, I didn't have my microphone close to my mouth. Okay. Is it well, better okay. now? Yeah. Okay, so uh, in the network construction, you are constructing this multivocal homology for, uh, for the group. So uh, can you pass to the flag varieties or uh, yeah, that's, the, that's the device that you were using, the DIs corresponding to the simple reflections, are they in the group or inside of the flag variety? Well, both, both statements are correct. So, the, so uh, what you really do you construct uh, some, uh, you consider pairs of, you, you fix a full, first of all, you fix one flag, fix one flag. Mm -hmm. And then you construct in flag variety divisor, uh, which is constructed using this flag, okay? Mm -hmm. But now you can think about this as follows. You can just take two elements in the group. So you can take elements G1 and G2. So they belong to G square. And you can consider like G1 acting on the first flag, and uh, G2 acting on the first flag. So now you're sitting in the square of flag variety, okay? Actually, I would prefer to sit not in B, but in the principal affine space. And so that's where you really live, you live here. And, but your construction is equivalent by the right action of G. And so that's why you land in the configuration space. So okay. you really live uh, in this variety, model G, but you can easily uh, uh, lift it to uh, G mod G, which projects here, or G mod G divided by G, which projects here. And that's precisely G, okay? <laughs> well, that's the reason I ask this construction. And uh, for the quantum version, I don't have obvious geometric picture, but uh, can some of the construction goes to the quantum version? No, they all go to quantum version. I see. So they, and you also have a configuration space as well. You have the notion quantum. of quantized quantum uh, variety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, this is the one which, which for example, we, we introduce with, with Velody Fox. So, and uh, all this uh, construction goes up there. Okay. So you can also write down the, the, the version of the, uh, the, the form, which gives the, uh, some, some sort of the log, uh, log forms. Uh, even this you can do, but that's not exactly, uh -huh. this is not, there are several ways how you can, uh, think about this. When I said to Jan that this is not the whole story, I mean basically that. Yeah. So the story, right. okay. is, is, the story is much more interesting because it's a non-commutative story and material homology is a commutative object. That's, that's the difference. But clusters give you immediately to the non-commutative land. So that's why it's okay. more interesting. But even if you don't want to hear about this, uh, again, I repeat again that my point was to explain one idea that if you don't like writing formulas classes on the stuff, but you, you are okay with material homology, then you, you, you cannot get away if you want to construct anything without discovering clusters. It's impossible. So that, that's the point. And it, it, it's impossible. And the, the usually it's, I, I was trying to explain that usually it's difficult to produce any kind of material homology class. Right? I explained this like in the case of elliptic curves. So we know it should exist, but uh, we don't know how to produce them in general. Okay. So Zhu, are you happy? Oh yes, very happy. Actually, I have okay. more questions. So the, uh, you, uh, you, 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 you can ask. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, I asked somebody else on the cluster algebra uh, conference, but the uh, scattering diagrams or so, 
here it is through the compute, computation of the cohomology using the uh, Cho uh, group theory. So is it, uh, is it uh, possible to compute the cluster variety which you didn't talk in general today? The Cho group for the cluster variety. I don't, I don't understand the question. I'm not talking about two groups of cluster variables. I know. I, I, I know. I know you didn't talk about that today, but you are one of those. Uh, uh, so I'm talking about a motivic cohomology of some very uh -huh. concrete and specific space. The space okay. is the cluster fine space of the group G. The point okay. is that this space has sort of cluster description. But this cluster mm -hmm. description does not define, does not des describe precise, I mean, cluster description and the space are different things. So uh, they help each other, but they, you, you cannot say that they're equal, okay? I see. A cluster structure okay. is a kind of structure in the space, but the space is a, has many other features. And so I don't know how to describe uh, Chow groups or anything from cluster variety. So I'm not, I'm not talking about this. Okay, oh, thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, more questions? Um, if not, uh, let's thank Sasha. And Sasha, can you email me the notes of, of your talk and we... Yeah.